Happy Juneteenth. Happy George Floyd Day, America. I hope you're enjoying Juneteenth. We have a special uh, version of Fearless today in celebration of the holiday that George Floyd brought us. Uh, we're going to discuss Mark Lamont Hill, who's a friend of the show. You guys have seen him here on the show. Mark is a leftist. And last week, I asked uh, Mark about his faith and whether or not he practiced any religious faith. And he dodged the question, said he didn't want to answer it, ducked and dodged. But over the weekend, uh, Sunday, uh, Mark sent me a sermon that he preached at St. Sabina in Chicago. This is a Catholic church on the south side of Chicago. I think it's located pretty close to O Block. Uh, anyway, uh, Mark sent me his sermon. Uh, I'm going to analyze it today uh, with Delano Squires first, and then with uh, Anthony and Virgil in Tennessee Harmony. So uh, buckle up. You're going to get to hear Mark Lamont Hill from the pulpit on Juneteenth. Next. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Thank you for joining me. Uh, a special edition of Fearless. Hey, make sure, one of the first things you do, make sure you're a Blaze TV subscriber so you can get all of our extra content this week. We've done something on uh, Charles Barkley's retirement, Steve Kim and I, and Sh Shamika and I did something about all this slapping and punching that's going on. Fearless Extra. In order to get that extra content, you got to go to blazetv.com backslash fearless, use the promo code fearless, and you can save $20 on your yearly subscription. The other thing you can do is thank our good friends at Good Ranchers. This is most important. Good Ranchers is so good to us. Today's episode is brought to you by Good Ranchers. Use my promo code fearless at goodranchers.com, and with your subscription, you can claim $100 off plus free smoked brats for a year while supporting veterans this Independence Day. It's time to revolt and claim your independence from the grocery store meat aisle. And it's also time to thank Good Ranchers for being such great supporters of us. Uh, before I bring Delano on, I just want to warm everybody up and warm Delano on. Give me one second. I just want to play you the first clip from Mark Lamont Hill at this Catholic church. It's predominantly black church in uh, Chicago. It's led by a white priest who's pretty popular. They invited Mark Lamont Hill this past Sunday to come and be the guest speaker in celebration of Juneteenth, which is today. Uh, Mark Lamont Hill uh, was in rare form. As I told you all uh, last week when we had Mark on the show talking about Caitlin Clark and some other things, Mark wouldn't talk about his faith walk. Uh, he said he likes to keep it private. But in response, he sends me this sermon he, taught, he preached at St. Sabina. I found it fascinating. Uh, I found it, uh, heret is it heretical? Her <laughs> Heresy? I don't anyway, uh, let's put, I don't know. Delano will correct me on the pronunciation. You know what, bring Delano on. Let me let, me let Delano correct me right he was a heretic. Is yeah. it her Why can't heretical. I say heretical? Heretical. Or, heretical. <laughs> I said heretical. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Delano, let me warm <clears throat> you and the audience up uh, with this first clip from uh, Mark Lamont Hill. And he kind of sets the tone in the stage. Juneteenth is all black. Play the clip but I'm honored to be celebrating Juneteenth this morning with you all. It is a day of celebration. And even though the Democrats and the Republicans and the government now honor it, we ain't gonna let them have it. 
We ain't going to let them take it over. We ain't going to let them turn it into Target and Walmart. We ain't going to let them turn it into McDonald's placemats. This is a day of sacrifice. This is a day of revolutionary love and joy. This is a day of black people turning up at the notch and making black people free. This is about justice for all of us. This is about love for all of us. This is about us keeping track of us. It's about us imagining a future that the world didn't see for us, but we saw for ourselves. The devil can't have it. The government can't have it. The White House can't have it. Our enemies can't have it. It is ours. Mm. Wow. And that was, I think, within the first, he did a prayer at the beginning. but So that had to be in the first seven to ten minutes because, you know, probably did a two, three minute prayer. But very early on, that's how he set the tone uh, for his sermon at St. Sabina. Uh, I, I found it fascinating, highly political. Delano, I sent you and Virgil and Anthony and I think TJ Moe uh, the sermon. Did you get to watch the entire thing? That's one. And then just your reaction to the tone that he set inside of a church. I, I did. I watched I watched the entire thing. It was fascinating. I'll say that. Um, I think just from things that I've seen in the public sphere, I, I certainly I've seen. Let me say it this way: I've seen Mark Lamont Hill speak more at length about Islam and speak more in Arabic when it comes to matters of religion and faith than I have hearing him give any sort of in-depth analysis of a, of any biblical text. So, but I, but I know he was at this church last year because I saw. Um, part of his speech from last year. So I wasn't surprised to see him back. And I know he was mentored by Michael Eric Dyson, who, in addition to being a professor, is also, I believe, an ordained Baptist preacher. So I wasn't surprised to see him there. Um, and least of all, because the black church has become largely a, 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 a particular subset of black churches. And I know Father Flager is white, but in terms of um, black preachers, a subset of them are certainly much more politically oriented than they are faithful to, to, you know, the scripture. So I wasn't surprised to see him there. I wasn't surprised to see him, I mean, completely annihilating this text. I mean, this is Mike Todd level of, of you know, sort of biblical <laughs> malpractice. Um, but that that one clip Hold for one on, second, hold for one uh -huh. second, hold for one second. You done okay. forced me to defend Mike Todd. <laughs> Mike Todd ain't never done this. I mean, or maybe... Uh, that's, I, I, I don't even think, compare Mike Todd to this, that, that tiny bit extreme, no? No, no, not, not at all, not at all. <laughs> and, and the comparison is this, um, they both preach a different strain of the prosperity gospel. Now, when people hear prosperity gospel, they tend to think, if, if I come to God and I serve God, my house will get bigger, my car will get better, my, my wife will look nicer, so on and so on and so forth. But... The sort of um, black liberation theology is itself a different type of prosperity gospel. It's if I come to God, um, all of the systems of oppression at work in society will be corrected, right? That the Christian faith is primarily about, not primarily about getting a bigger house and a nicer car, it's primarily about upending the current set of systems that keep marginalized people down and oppressed and ushering in a new wave. So it, it, I think they're very much similar. But again, Mike Todd has more flair. He's, he's, this is his vocation. So it comes across different. Hill, you could tell, is a professor who I'm sure has been spent time in black churches um, trying to pay, perform uh, black, the sort of black ministerial tradition. It, it didn't even come off as natural as Michael Eric Dyson. So it, that, that was part of the, the fascination. And, and one of the things, Jason, that made it clear that this is not his vocation is because of the clip you showed just now, right? Where, as you said, within the first five to seven minutes, he was already at a fever pitch. And, and this type of sort of um, premature exaltation or, or, or you know, uh, exuberation is not the type of thing a, a black preacher would do. He, he sort of works up. A good preacher is going to work up to getting to that point, whereas Hill comes in off the top rope. Now, 
he would say he was set, he was setting the stage for the rest of the speech. But to me, he, he got caught up too early, and and he, as I said, was a little premature in the things that he was saying. But the the entire thirty eight minutes was a fascinating display. So I don't think he was imitating a Christian minister, Christian black minister, Christian minister. I thought he was going Malcolm X, Louis Farrakhan. And I'm talking about old school mm. Malcolm X. That, that's, and that's what, because he hit those crescendo points several times throughout. Mm -hmm. And so he, he was just letting you know off top, I'm about to do Malcolm X. He, he's watched a bunch of Malcolm X clips and, and he's seen enough Louis Farrakhan he was going for the jugular early because he was going to go back to it several times, and he did. And so I actually, it's the wrong venue, but I actually thought, oh, uh, I get what he's doing, and, and it's, it's better than I thought. Now, again, I, I found it all illogical and inappropriate, but the shtick that he was doing, I actually found kind of impressive. Interesting. So I, th this may open up a, di a completely different conversation. Um, but I, 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 to the extent that you say you felt more of a Farrakhan Malcolm vibe, I actually think that speaks to how the, the evolution, the devolution of the black preacher over the last 60 plus years, because what he was, the his cadence, his tone, his intonation, his storytelling, the call and response is exactly what you would get from a Jeremiah Wright, from an Otis Moss III, from a Freddie Haynes III, right? From a William Murphy, from a Jamal Bryant, from a William Barber. It's a, it's a very similar um, sort of preaching style. And I think to, to the extent that that can be compared to Farrakhan, is instructive. And I, I would agree in, in terms of your analysis. And one of the interesting things is that outside of his his mosque in Chicago, I have seen Louis Farrakhan far more often in black churches than I have in sort of, you know, uh, facilities or, or, or uh, Islamic institutions, right? I see him show up all the time in black churches. So I'm, I'm not surprised by that. And I think what you've seen is that the black religious tradition, I'm, I'm speaking generally now, there has been a, a melding of the different sort of factions, the, the black preacher, the black Muslim, um, to some respects, the black Hebrew Israelite, who aside from their sort of theological differences are all fighting for their sense of uh, black dignity, black liberation, black freedom, so on and so on, B black political power. And I think Hill was just, Mark Lamont Hill was just expressing that in his own version, but again, it didn't, I, I've heard Michael Eric Dyson sort of preach, and it, it has, he is, he seems much more like a guy who's an ordained Baptist minister, and it didn't come off that way from Mark Lamont Hill. But it's interesting that you felt more Farrakhan than, than I did. And, and, and Malcolm X, because here's what ran through my mind early, as soon as I heard that, you've been hoodwinked. Bamboozle. <laughs> right. Let us stray. Let us stray. Run them up. Plymouth Rock yeah. didn't land on, right. you know, Plymouth Rock landed on blah, blah. It, that's what he was doing. And Delano, my more substantive point, and, and it did run through my mind watching this, mm. is that uh, the reason why you go that route mm. is once you disconnect from Jesus Christ, you now... It's your performance is more important than Jesus's words and mm -hmm. the scripture. And so all, all, when you take Malcolm X with the nation, he's disconnected from Jesus Christ. Uh, and so it's performative. It's the, the preacher is the clear superstar uh, of this. And so he went straight again. It's like Michael Jackson took the stage and he played Thriller right off the top. Because mm. he, he's sitting there going, well, trust me, I got beat it, and I, I got mm -hmm. all these other songs, Man in the Mirror, blah, I can get here, you know, I got a whole plethora of these things I've practiced and, and are ready to bring the crowd up and down. So that I'm t I heard Malcolm X, and I was sitting there like, oh, okay, th this is 
this is what he did. And again, he sent this to me, Delano, because last week I asked him about his faith and he wouldn't say it. And so out of nowhere, he sends me the sermon to say, hey, look, I, I speak at churches. I don't know if he's trying to say he's some sort of Christian. I didn't pick that up from no. uh, watching this. But uh, <laughs> let, let me, what do you think of his statement that, that like, he's made, Juneteenth is specifically for us and we're not going to, and he's the devil. Again, that's the other reason he brought up the devil. I'm not going to let the white house, this again, why I'm like, this is nation of Islam preaching. Uh, and, and which there are people that told me when I asked the questions, like, Hey man, this dude's a Muslim. You know, mm-hmm. why are you speculating? And, and maybe he sound again, he sounded like a Muslim preacher in, in, in the deal. But what do you think of his assertion that Juneteenth is basically a black holiday. Mm. And, and let's, say, let's say I agree with him, and that's why it doesn't need to be a federal holiday because it's not for everybody, and the biggest proponents of Juneteenth are, are arguing, hey, this ain't for everybody. This is for us, and we're going to own it and take it back. The devil, the government, the, the White House, they can't have it. He's making a separatist argument. So I, I, I want to answer that question, but but again, I, I want to go back to the to yep. the the sort of preaching style piece because as you were talking, I, I thought of something, uh, and I said I think I might have said this uh, maybe about a week ago, one of my um, previous appearances. I think one of the things that got the black church off of the rails, or or the black community off of the rails, is when we is when we stop looking to the church for sort of moral instruction and ethical foundation and started to look towards revolutionary politics. And one of the biggest differences between a Mark Lamont Hill, who's a self-identified revolutionary, and even let's say a Louis Farrakhan, is that um, their politics, particularly on social issues, are going to land them in very, very different places, right? Mark Lamont Hill is like, look, everybody do whatever you want. I don't make judgments on certain things. I certainly don't make judgments on sex, sexuality, gender identity, so, so on and so on and so forth. Whereas a Farrakhan is going to say, no, we can't be a society or a people or a nation that's built on two men um, shacking up with each other and think that we're going to survive, survive both in terms of human nature and survive God's wrath. So I, I think there's a difference in terms of where the two ideologies would end up. To, to the question you asked, um, on many, in many respects, I agree with Mark Lamont Hill. Like, n- not on that this holiday is for us exclusively, right? Obviously, it's a holiday that has a particular resonance to, um, and, and let me be even more precise, to multi generational Black Americans, right? To to the Black folks whose ancestors were enslaved in this country, and particularly those from Texas, right? Like my wife, it has a, a special place in their hearts. Juneteenth does. Where I agree with him is. Once the holiday became a federal holiday, it's 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 like uh, Democrats at a at a, a drag queen story hour. They can't keep their ha- hands off of it, right? Like how they deal with kids. They can't keep their hands off of it. So yes, now it's let's uh, Juneteenth is about commercialism. I don't know if you saw the clip last week, but at the Juneteenth celebration at the White House, you have a cross dresser, Billy Porter. S- sitting in the front row, he didn't start off there, by the way. He came in to work in the middle of the, the, the event and has ended up sitting on the same row, a couple people down from the president of the United States, right? He's in his full transvestite regalia. He's bopping to Kirk Franklin, who's on the stage, and, and Billy Franklin, you know, Billy Porter's doing his thing. So I think to, to that extent that the holiday has been co-opted by people, and let me, let me be self-critical, from my own people, from the West Indians in New York and Philadelphia and D.C., who think Juneteenth is some Pan-African holiday, right? It's about the global struggle. No, this particular You calling holiday, out the tethers? Are you calling <laughs> out the tethers on this show? <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but, but there's something to be said for, you know, just like words have a meaning— um, holidays have a particular purpose, and and we can see this clearly when Christmas moves from being about the birth of Jesus to being about, you know, buying some kid some gift that your ungrateful kid is not going to play with. We can see how Juneteenth moves from a state holiday from Texas that celebrates, you know, the freeing of the slaves, you know, two uh, close to three years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, to 
a federal holiday that in many respects was brought about by the death of George Floyd that is now pushed in target, is now turned into some Pan-Africanist thing, Pan-African um, celebration, and, and, and undoubtedly will be tied to what's going on in Israel and Gaza, and particularly, you know, from, from their perspective, Palestinian liberation. So in that, in that sense, I agree with him that it's, this holiday has a meaning and it shouldn't be bastardized by people who want to use it for political purposes. Those, that group of people includes Mark Lamont Hill, who used Juneteenth and the Book of Esther as a pretext for him to talk about school funding, um, you know, we'll gentrification. So I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're getting there. The, the, the only other thing I, I would add here, Delano, is his assertion that, you know, this is the day of celebration. We, and his, I don't remember his exact words, but basically he's arguing like, we freed ourselves or mm -hmm. we, we did this, black people, blah, blah, blah. And, and to me, it's very, because obviously we played a role in freeing ourselves, no question about it. From Richard Allen or Frederick Douglass, to, you know, we played a role in freeing ourselves. But it's it's almost like how people in Russia hear about World War II, and they hear America beating their chest. <laughs> we stopped Hitler. We we blah blah blah. We we won World War II, and it's the atomic bomb. And and, and the Russians are sitting over there going, you know, twenty million Russians died during World War II, mm. and and. I think five, six hundred thousand maybe Americans died, and, and y'all sitting over there like, y'all carried the heavy load, y'all did this, blah, blah. It, it, it's crazy to Russians. And so when it comes to the Civil War and just the body count and who, who died and who sacrificed them, and, and it's, oh, we found out late and this is this national holiday and it's just for us. That sounds crazy to the people that actually died and sacrificed their lives. And if we went to the actual data and numbers, we wouldn't be telling, well, black people did this. Now, Christians did this, many of them white, and, and that's who needs the glory. And that's who, with Memorial Day, which was started by black people in 1865 or 1866, my memory's a tiny bit off, but thanking, Again, we started that as a thank you to the people that lost their lives in the Civil War. And now, because and, and Texas, to me, appropriately, like, hey, we didn't find out till Juneteenth, we're going to remember this day, or a certain part of Texas didn't, we're going to remember this day. But to now, for the rest of the country, because George Floyd died, say, you know what, the whole country's got to honor this little tiny distinction in Texas it's crazy and it's silly, uh, and it's it's again it's it's not standing on truth and facts. And he's he's leaving out. That's the number one thing a church and a religious ceremony should be about is the pursuit of truth and the representation mm. of truth. And he's not doing a good job here. Uh, before I I want to play you another clip mm -hmm. about the Book of Esther. But before I do that, I want to uh, talk to you guys about this July Fourth. Claim your independence from the meat aisle. Prices are up, quality is down in the store, and there are more imports than ever. It's time to revolt. Goodranchers.com is the number one place to get 100% American meat for this uniquely American holiday. Celebrate the sweet taste of freedom with savory meats conveniently delivered right to your door, and they're all born, raised, and made right here in the US of A. Whether you're hosting a backyard barbecue, a poolside party, or a beach bonfire, Good Ranchers has you covered. In fact, right now you can save on Good Ranchers meat like never before. Subscribe to any Good Ranchers box now and get $100 off plus free smoked brats for a year. It's more than just a great deal. It's a chance to celebrate America by supporting American family farms and enjoying the highest quality American meat. All you have to do to claim this offer is go to GoodRanchers.com and subscribe to any of their custom curated boxes filled with 100% American beef, chicken, pork, or wild-caught seafood, use my promo code FEARLESS at checkout to claim your $100 off and free smoked brats for a year. Get free shipping on all your orders and make this Independence Day one to remember. If you needed any other reason to support Good Ranchers, 
They're not only amazing partners of my show, but they support the paralyzed veterans of America too. Every order saves American farms and supports American veterans. Change the way you buy meat today at GoodRanchers.com and use my promo code FEARLESS to claim your $100 off plus free brats for a year. Make this Independence Day unforgettable with food that brings everyone together and flavors that honor the spirit of America. GoodRanchers.com, American meat delivered. Delano, uh, let's move to uh, the <laughs> alleged substance of Mark Lamont Hill's sermon in Chicago. Let's play uh, SOT 15. So I decided to go to the book of Esther. In the fourth chapter, in the 13th verse, Mordecai says to Esther, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to royal position. Some translations would say that you have arrived in the kingdom for such a time as this. Now some would say that's a strange scripture to read on a day of freedom. We're celebrating freedom and Dr. Hill over here talking about unfreedom. We're talking about liberation and celebrating no longer being captive. And he's talking about people who are held captive, people who have a plot to kill them, people who are ready to die or ready to be plotted upon to die. Why would you read this scripture on this day? Well, my line of thinking is that this in so many ways reflects the moment that we are in. There's never a moment of complete freedom. There ain't never a moment where we all good. Even at moments of celebration, we must keep track of those who can't celebrate. There's somebody in Cook County Jail right now, or Rikers Island, or Sing Sing, or Green, or wherever who can't be here with us. There's somebody who's working 18 hours a day because the month lasts longer than their money, who don't have the luxury of sitting here and worship with us. There's somebody on the sick and shut-in list who would love to be here and their mind and their spirit is with us, but their bodies cannot be. Unfreedom is always around. Unfreedom is always around. This is the substance, and I, I spent some time yesterday uh, looking through the verses that he used and reading other people's interpretation uh, of the verses. I, I, I'm no expert, but I, I did hear from Virgil. He, you know, he was <laughs> quite critical, saying like, "Man, this guy's taking this whole story." completely out of context, uh, your thoughts? I mean, th that part was clear. I mean, this is cl a clear case of him trying to, you know, proof text something. So the, the, one of the biggest problems with how people misuse the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, right, where you have di obviously different books. You have the books of prophecy. You have, you have uh, the Psalms. You have Proverbs of wisdom, right? Um, but you also have books of history, and these are books that retell things that actually happened. But what people do, particularly the Old Testament, is they'll read a text from the Old Testament. They, they, will, they will read the verses to their credit. They get step one right. And then they go straight. They give some little bit of context. And then they go straight into application. And that application is always about something that they want to talk about already. Now, imagine, Jason, how this would look if you were in school and you read the battle of, you know, some battle in the Civil War, the Se or the Second World War, Vietnam War. And you go from talking about the, the parties, the, the belligerents in this particular conflict, to saying, well, you know, this applies to our fight right now against hunger and against poverty. And this is like, well, but this is not what this particular text is talking about. Um, so it was clear to me 
that he was um, misusing the biblical text for his own sort of political purposes. Now, one of the things, and I, I'll leave this to, to Virgil and Pastor Anthony, is that one of the things the Old Testament um, is heavy on is even in the telling of history of, you know, biblical narrative, that oftentimes there's a foreshadowing of the coming Christ. So somebody may play the role of a savior, a little s, in a, in a particular story or redeemer in a particular story. And what it should make the, the literate Christian who understands that the, the old points to the new and the new references back to the old is to say, oh, this person is playing a particular role and foreshadowing the, the one who will come and, and be the final sacrifice, the ultimate king, the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest. But when your mind is focused on politics, you miss all of that and you just say, oh, Esther is, is just like you all. And in the same way that she had to speak up on behalf of her people, the Jews, which is quite ironic considering, considering some of the things, you know, the positions that he takes, you all need to speak up on behalf of, of your people you know, wherever they may be on for school funding and so on and so on and so forth. So, yeah, complete misinterpretation, misapplication of the text. But as I said, Jason, when I, when my wife and I used to go to this old church close to where we live, we would listen, sometimes listen to WHUR, Howard University Radio, on the way back from church. And it would be it would be whoever was preach, preaching at Rankin Chapel that day on Howard's campus. And this is exactly what the messages sounded like when people were reading from you know, preaching some text from the Old Testament. They just, they take it, they strip it of its historical context. They strip it of its sort of, um, you know, sort of prophetic, uh, you know, weight, and they make it all about modern day politics. And this was no different than that. And that's what was so disconcerting, uncomfortable for me. Church was packed. Everybody's applauding. People are standing up on their feet. It's like, it felt like no one's questioning any of this as he totally, totally politicized the Bible to fit his narrative. And, and I'm sure he'll watch this and maybe we'll have Mark on to discuss it, but he'll say, well, isn't that what conservatives do? That they politicize the Bible to fit their narrative. Uh, I, I'm going to let Virgil and Anthony carry the weight here. But I did this next clip really, really hit home for me because just how he got here, uh, taking Esther and the Jewish woman and, and turned it into, uh, you know, sometimes the gang, the gang banger comes out in me or needs to come out and corporate America just won't let me do that. Let's play SOT 16. And Esther had made her way into the kingdom, her beauty captivated everybody. She took everyone over with her beauty and her charm. And so she became the queen. Part of how she became the queen, of course, was to hide her Jewish identity. Mordecai advised her that it might be healthy to do so. Just like today, there's so much anti-Jewish sentiment. There's so much hatred and racism and so much stuff going on. Sometimes you got to hide who you are to get into the kingdom. I think some of y'all understand what it means to hide who you are to get into the kingdom because sometimes the kingdom can't recognize you. Sometimes that job that you want, sometimes that institution that you want to be a part of, sometimes that change you want to make recognizes you but can't recognize that part of you that they don't realize makes you who you are. What am I saying? I'm saying that sometimes you want the job but the south side you got to tuck in a little bit. You got to hide that west side just a little bit. That way you talk when you on the weekends, you can't say at the job until you get the job. Sometimes you, you, talk, you speak the queen's English to the king's taste so you can get into the job. And then when you get in, you can let your cousins in and your aunties in and the people on the block in. Sometimes you like a Trojan horse. You walk up in, they think they're getting a nice, cute, light-skinned, half-negro. And you get in there and all of a sudden the ancestors come out. The homeboys come out. The dope boys come out. The people from the block come out. The ex-cons come out. Everybody comes out because you understand that there's something that the kingdom don't recognize that is still valuable. That was mind-blowing to me. Mm. That, that, and that the fact that Michael Flager, someone who's a th theologian, an evangelical, someone that knows the Bible, he just let 
Michael, he just let Mark Lamont Hill define the kingdom as the world. But that's what he's talking about. How can I win favor in the world? How can I make more money and get into corporate America? And I got to hide who I really am. I'm really this dope boy. I'm really this around the way girl. I'm really this corner boy. I'm really this ex-con. And, you know, I got to hide that to get into the kingdom, man's kingdom, not God's kingdom. And, and I'm just blown away that that was allowed. Uh, but... It was, I don't know, your takeaways from that. I mean, I wasn't surprised. To me, this is completely on brand. And just from what I know, the little I know from, with F F Father Flager, who, from my knowledge, is very active in the community, right, On in terms of trying to prevent violence on the South Side and so on and so forth. But I don't think he would ever be confused with some sort of theologically, um, theologically conservative or theologically biblical um, you know, uh, disciple or anything like that. So I'm, I'm not surprised. He's to me, he is the epitome of a a political preacher. And to me, it makes sense that he would invite Mark Lamont Hill, who he obviously knows because they had him last year. So he knows what he's going to preach. Um, I, again, I'm not surprised. I do. There is even even the comparison between Esther's Jewish heritage and sort of the p people today in terms of the behaviors in which they engage, right? So you're a corner boy, you're a dope boy. Those two things are not even close to being the same. Um, but for Mark Lamont Hill, he, he basically was, that piece was him giving life and words to that old Dave Chappelle skit when keeping it real goes wrong. When the black guy, you know, sort of got, you know, disrespect, not disrespected, but from his perspective, disrespected by his white coworker, and then he had to think, well, how am I going to respond? Am I going to respond saying, oh, hey, Dave, I didn't appreciate that quip, or am I going to go full, you know, south side on him? And he does, and then he gets fired from his job, and you see him pumping gas at the gas station. I think that's what Mark Lamont Hill was trying to say, but once I know that someone has no regard for the Bible in terms of its purpose, in terms of its... Um, you know, the, the, who the Bible is about and who it's for. They have no um, desire to hold to its infallibility or its historicity. Once I know people don't respect the Bible, nothing else they say when it comes to their attempts to preach a sermon is going to surprise me. Um, so I, I wasn't surprised by this. I, I get what he was trying to say. And you could see how sort of tenuous the links he was making between Esther hiding her Jewish heritage and then, you know, Tyrone hiding that he's really from the block. But this is what happens when people don't respect the word. They'll, they'll, this is what I call Abu Ghraib preaching, right? Because when you torture a text enough, long enough, you can get it to say virtually anything. But Delano, and I will ask Mark Lamont Hill this at some point, but He's, she hid her Jewish identity. That's his argument. And so he's making the argument to black people, your identity is a dope boy, is an mm. ex-con, and you have to hide that. You, you don't speak proper English, and you have to hide that. And so he's defining black identity in a very racist manner. This is mm. like what the KKK would say. Is like, I know you Negroes have to hide who you really are and you can't curse and turn violent and sell dope like you want to. You have to hide that from me. That, that, that's, and he, to great applause, he said mm. these things. It's crazy to me. And, and he, he went even further. And I'm sure you caught this with, the, with the, the sort of colorist reference. The company thought they were getting some tame, light-skinned, ha half, some half light-skinned Negro, but Negro. then the, the ancestors yeah. came out. Now, what you really want to say is then, then the real black came out, right? The, the, the true African came out, the true African revolutionary came out, which, which sort of furthers this sort of stereotype that light-skinned people, you know, aren't really, really black in the way that Mark Lamont Hill conceives of blackness um, because, you know, their, their, their proximity to whiteness sort of dilutes their revolutionary capacity and potential. So, I mean, it was it was all bad, but yes, the way he sort of frames sort of black racial identity is not the way 
a Booker T. Washington would have framed it 100 plus years ago. It's all about the 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 subversives, the the criminal element, all the things. It's it's street. It's not corp because the notion that somebody has to hide who they are and then they like they're not this sort of corporate persona, you know, is itself an issue. But this is this is consistent with I think the worldview that he puts out there. Uh, final clip I want to play for you, Delano, is his argument that Jesus was a political prisoner. Uh, let's play SOT 17. Every single day, there is a plot to kill our babies. Yeah. It ain't got to be written in ink. It ain't got to be put in an edict. Every single day you walk into our schools and you see a plot to kill our babies. Every time you go into a city and there's lead in the water and the babies can't drink and mothers can't cook and fathers can't live, there is a plot to kill our babies. Every single day black folk in this congregation die from preventable diseases because we don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter. There is a plot to kill our babies. The richest empire in human history and people die every single day because they ain't got health care. There is a plot to kill our babies. We dump billions into prison and hundreds into schools. There is a plot to kill our babies. To celebrate Juneteenth is not to ignore the fact that there still remains a set of systems a set of structures that are designed to kill us. Yes, sir. Come on, huh? yeah. Sometimes Christian folk, you say, well, I'm a believer, I ain't got time to worry about systems. I'm here about faith. Yeah. I'm here to follow Jesus. But Jesus was critiquing the systems. Yeah. Jesus was a political prisoner. How do you spend that much time talking about the plot to kill our babies without mentioning Planned Parenthood mm. blows my mind. The, the leading killer of black babies is Planned Parenthood and never gets mentioned. You know, uh, Crips in the Bloods are somewhere, Vice Lords, Gangster Disciples, the dudes running around on the old block, they're somewhere on that list uh, involved in the plot to kill our babies, never mentioned. Uh, no access to food, clothing, or shelter with all these government subsidies, I just don't know if that's accurate. No access to, I mean, th this is, and Mark Lamont Hill has traveled the globe. He knows that what we call poor here in America, <laughs> in many places on the country, would be considered wealthy. Mm. It, it, it's, but to leave Planned Parenthood out, plot to kill our babies, it's like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> OG, he's O.J. Simpson on the hunt for the real killers, and the real killers is, I guarantee you, you could walk from St. <clears throat> Sabina to a Planned Parenthood clinic, an uh, easy walk, and but he can't see it. Jason, when I, when I heard that part of the speech, I was gonna call it, it's not a sermon. I, I mean, I almost crashed my car. I, I have, this is for the guys in production, I have never wanted access to a clip of video more so than when he started talking about plot to kill our babies up until he started talking about, you know, imitating the person who says, I'm not about systems and structures, I'm about faith. Please send that to me because these, the leftist revolutionaries have zero self-awareness. This is a man, it's not that he just left out Planned Parenthood and didn't talk about abortion, it's that Mark Lamont Hill supports abortion because he, taught, he referenced it lightly towards the end when he said, you know, uh, trying to take take away women's rights or something to that effect, rights to their bodies or so, something to that effect. Mark Lamont Hill is, is he, he might not say he's pro-abortion. He's certainly, quote, unquote, pro-choice. I'm, I'm sure he says he'll say that abortion is part of the liberation struggle and it's about a uh, woman's right to choose and reproductive justice and reproductive health care. So this guy, it, 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 it wasn't that he got close to it. He didn't say the things that are killing us or, uh, you know, destroying our bodies. He literally said a plot to kill our babies and never once mentioned abortion or never once stopped himself and said, well, hold on, guys. 
Well, I know some some conservatives. I know Jason Whitlock's about to find this clip and take it out of context and, and, and make it about abortion. Not one, not an iota of self-awareness or, or sort of self-reflection. And to me, that caps, captures leftism in a perfect sort of three minute segment. This guy can talk about a plot to kill our babies. And instead of talking about, as you said, Planned Parenthood, the abortion industry, all, all of the the, 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 the mechanisms, the ecosystems on the left that want to see the black family um, never come back together. The, the anti-racists, the paternalists, the abortionists, the feminists, the pride activists, and, and people respectfully like Mark Lamont Hill and the many black folk who will go to that church and support this, this message, the functional atheists who like black church culture but have no tolerance for actual biblical doctrine. These are the people, this is, Mark Lamont Hill should go get a, a job on uh, Jamal Bryant's staff uh, down at New Birth, because when Dobbs came down and Roe was overturned, Jamal Bryant said for 10 minutes, man, they, this is an attack on black women, and, and when black women put their mind to something, they, they'll accomplish anything. And then 10 minutes later, did a baby dedication with no sense of self-awareness. So yeah, the him talking about Jesus being you know, a revolutionary and he's critiquing the systems. This is sort of standard leftist fare. You, you, I could get that in an Episcopalian church, you know, a white Episcopalian church in the Northeast. But when he spent that time talking about a plot to kill our babies and then say a word about abortion, oh boy, to them, Margaret Sanger is a patron saint and she'll always have a place at the cookout. So this is, this, this is what you get when you, when you cast your lot with the left. So final question, and don't have a lot of time, but final question. I, I uh, experienced uh, uh, a black mega church uh, this Sunday, and <clears throat> you know it was filled with uh, democratic talking points and, and just stuff that you know just isn't my cup of tea. How, how what percentage? Hmm. of the black church is captured by this black liberation political ideology what per influenced by the Malcolm X Louis Farrakhan impersonations hmm. what what percent cuz it i know the Wooten guy in North Carolina mm -hmm. but it's it's i'm look what percentage is this? Is this heavily influenced by this political idolatry? That, that is a, an excellent and fascinating question. Um, it's hard to say because God always has a remnant. And I think the churches that are gospel preaching and Bible teaching that are faithful, the pastors who are faithful to their biblical call, don't get anywhere near the type of publicity and don't have the influence that these churches and these pastors have on a national scale. I pray to God that we just see it, but it's not the majority. My, my, if I was to give a, the most honest analysis, I think there are a significant number, uh, let's say 40-50% let's say of black churches that are liberation theology light. Not this far, right? Many of them will still talk about sin and how um, bondage to sin is the the worst form of slavery even more than chattel slavery because bondage to sin will send your hell your soul to hell for an eternity right so i, I still think that the church is like that but still are very much involved in politics and would say that they're socially conscious um i i think again there's a remnant of bible preaching gospel teaching churches right um i think there's the prosperity wing the mike Taz, the td jakes that's probably bigger than what i would like to acknowledge i will say this in terms of the most influential black churches and black preachers, the ones who get um, visits from politicians from August and November of an election year, I would say that of those churches, easily 90%, 90 plus percent are in this lane in terms of the sort of the liberation theology. And to me, the archetype of that is the very man who represents Georgia in the US Senate, Ra Senate Raphael Warnock, who also pastors the church that Dr. Martin Luther King used to pastor, uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church. He is the archetype 
for that sort of black, uh, politically minded, uh, socially conscious preacher who holds to the sort of tradition, the traditions, the homiletics of the of the black preacher, but also will say, well, actually, the Bible is for abortion and for same sex mirage. So I, I think, and when it comes to the most influential black churches and black preachers. I say, sadly, nine out of 10 are going to be in that camp. Thank you, Delano. Thank you, I, Jason. I certainly agree uh, with Delano in, in terms of like, it seems like the only way to capture an audience, to grow your church, or to just to capture an audience, a black audience, you have to play the victim to some degree. May not be the main focus, of your church or your content or whatever. But unless you're willing to play the victim, and, and this is, and, and again, Christianity, in my view, is about rejecting victimhood. And so the entire message from the church should be, I'm no victim, I'm on team Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it's, Every popular black content creator, people in the church or whatever, they always leave that victimhood door open. It's just to what degree. But trust, everybody knows that door is open. I'm open to being a victim. And you just, if you follow this Bible, Follow the life of Jesus Christ. You just can't be a victim. You, you just have to reject that. And I go back to uh, roll call. Notorious, glorious, and victorious. It's written in the book. We're victorious, so we can't play the victim. Uh, <clears throat> we'll, hear, we'll have some Tennessee harmony uh, just around the corner. Uh, before we do that, though, I, I want to talk to you guys about an opportunity. Uh, if you join the blazetv.com subscription model, uh, Sarah Gonzalez and the Blaze original team uh, have done an excellent docu-series on voter fraud. Voter fraud exposed how an election can be stolen. Sarah and the Blaze original team went down to Michigan and did some investigative work about what's going on in the state of Michigan and how elections are manipulated. And it will open your eyes, take the scales off your eyes, so you can see how what's done in Michigan can be done on a grand scale across the United States of America. I can't recommend this any higher. Voter fraud exposed how elections can be stolen. Uh, use the promo code voter fraud at blazeoriginals.com backslash Whitlock to get $30 off an annual subscription to Blaze TV so you can see Sarah's work and the Blaze Originals team's work on what's going on with our elections. I can't recommend this any higher. You need to watch this before November. You need to watch it before July. You need to watch it before tomorrow. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's blazeoriginals.com backslash Whitlock. Use the promo code voter fraud. Get $30 off your annual subscription to Blaze TV. Uh, Tennessee Harmon. Next. Man, you are loaded for bear. Bye. You have all the. You, you just talked me into Laluca Donkins. Laluca Donkins. That's who we're looking. At. I can't believe it. Shut up with my mug on me. Oh, DD. Oh, what it is? Oh, DD. What? It is? I was not prepared to to believe that coming into this conversation, but. You've talked me into <sighs> Welcome back to Beef. As I walk you through uh, my top 50 media beefs of all time. Yeah, I'm an equal opportunity beefer. It's like, Randy, are you asleep at the wheel? Big lips are in style. I'd love to squash this beef. I mean, I was not real happy at all. I, I, 
I was less than thrilled. I was displeased. And now we have B. Yeah, I probably look a little better than what I did with Delano's because I got a haircut and a shave in between the segments. I changed shirts. Uh, but anyway, it's time for Tennessee Harmony. And as promised, we'll get the expert uh, advice from Anthony and Virgil, the semi-expert advice from Kevin Donahue uh, as we talk a little bit more about uh, Mark Lamont Hill's Juneteenth uh, sermon, speech, rant, at St. Sabina. Uh, before we do that, Anthony, I'll pray us in. Father God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is true and that it stands forever. Help us to embrace your word, your truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so Delano and I just spent 30, 40 minutes uh, talking about it, but I, I, I wanted to get an expert opinion and I know uh, normally I would probably come to you, but Virgil is on fire. He's written a column. He's texted all of us 10 different times. Uh, so I'm going to let Virgil get the ball rolling in terms of your reaction to uh, Mark Lamont Hill's. Uh, I, should I call it a sermon, Virgil, or what, what, what should I call that? It, it was it was a rant, but I, I want to start by saying, man, the haircut and shave, the new look, the fr you look fantastic, Jason. Absolutely fantastic. I just want to start the commentary there. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's the type of uh, no substance praise that you can expect Virgil to give me uh, style over substance. Now, I'll, I'll say something smart and he'll totally ignore it. But. Yeah, commenting on, yeah, I look better with all that gray hair on my face. That's a, that's a layup version, but go ahead. Go, go. Anyway, let's get down to business. <laughs> that said, Mark Lamont Hill, with all due respect to him, I thought he opened well in that he knew the folks that were there, uh, you know, at the church. I, I don't know if it was a Catholic church or what, what, what it was, but uh, it just goes off the rails from there. Uh, I mean, it, it basically, uh, you know, he uses a text of scripture, uh, and Esther, the story of Esther, and totally butchers its meaning, its narrative, uh, really begins to sound more like, he ends up sounding more like James Cone, the father of black liberation theology, than he does sounding like Jesus Christ, uh, the founder of the faith. And so I, I was just uh, disheartened from the beginning. Um, the whole part, the whole point of his message sounded like a, a throwback to the 1960s civil rights movement uh, where we all should sing, we shall overcome, uh, rather than recognizing we, we have overcome uh, and, and we're here, it's a new day, we're to enjoy the freedom that we've been, that we've received through Christ. Uh, just totally missed it, totally whiffed uh, on the opportunity uh, to, to amplify Juneteenth if he was going to celebrate it. Uh, but, but more importantly, in that space in particular, to promote Jesus Christ and the freedom that we found as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection as followers of Christ. So Anthony and, and Virgil circle back in if, if Anthony leaves any meat on the bone, but uh, he used the book of Esther and some scripture from there. D did he use it properly? Could we dig in on that? No, no. Obviously, when you use scripture, when you preach, when you're teaching and you use scripture, you want to stick with the context. What actually took place at the time? What was being done? What was its meaning in its direct context? But then also, what is its meaning in its broader context? What does this really point to? And he, all he used the text for was obviously for the line for such a time as this. And a lot of people use that line. But then he uses that to jump into the topics that he wants to talk about. He wants to talk about being liberated. He wants to talk about changing the law. He wants to talk about sometimes going against the law. But for what purpose? And what it leaves you with is, I think that's what Virgil is alluding to, what it leaves you with is, okay, so are we to be violent now? Are we to see ourselves, as Mark Lamont Hill says, as oppressed people? Will anybody be able to receive this message? That's another piece that I'm always critical of in preachers. Can anybody take this message and be led back to the cross of Christ? Or is this that's just right. for a certain segment? And this would only matter to black people who are 
only viewing themselves in this way. But to a black person that looks at this and says, wait a minute, I, I'm not here to be, you know, just identified by the melanin in my skin. I have some more major problems. I've got a sin issue. When I looked at this, I was thinking I had two questions as I watched it for about three or four times. Liberated from what? And change the law from what to what? So I'm thinking if you're talking about being liberated, the Bible really speaks to the fact that we are all at some point enslaved to sin. That's what Jesus comes to liberate us from the power of the enemy over us, the power of sin over our lives. He frees us from that. And then that sets me free from everything. When I am free in Christ, I am free indeed. So there's nothing else that can imprison me. No, no skin color, no culture, no whatever. I'm free. But then secondly, he was talking about changing the law. And one of the things he he alluded to was, you know, changing the laws from women's you know, rights, change the law. And I'm reproductive thinking, rights. Right. Right. And I'm saying I get it. I, I get what he's trying to do. But I'm thinking if we change the law, God made nature. He made the law. He made the fact that babies are developed in the womb of a mother. So her body, when God made all of that, her body is up to be used in this way for God's glory. So if we change that, you have to change the law of nature. You'd have to change God himself. So, you know, I, it, he left it a whole lot out there. Um, I don't know. He, he, I don't think he handled the text in a way. If he had alluded to the fact that we are slaves to sin and that Christ came to deliver us from that. Now we're going somewhere, but just to see it in this black, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, black and I'm oppressed. You'll, you'll lose the audience. Uh, Kevin, <clears throat> I'm not experienced with the Catholic church as a child. Yes, I was. Uh, but, and that's my father, his second wife, my stepmother, uh, her kids went to a, a Catholic school and I attended some Catholic mass with them from time to time. And, and my limited understanding of like Catholic church, it, it, it's like seeing someone like a Mark Lamont Hill speaking at a Catholic church. That's not my, uh, was it a Catholic church? St. Sabina's I think is a Catholic church. And that dude seemed to be, didn't the white guy standing behind him seem to be wearing Catholic garb? Yeah, I, Saint Sabina is a Catholic church okay. in Chicago, and Michael Fleger, the the white pastor priest there, uh, is pretty well known. So that's what was I was like. So as just as am I right in my thinking, like Catholic church, that's they don't use that type of ministering or preaching normally. Not no. normally. I yeah. mean, it's the, the the Catholic church relies heavily on tradition, but you have a broad swath. I mean, you have, you know, Biden calls himself a Catholic and he's a pro-abortion, I mean, super left-wing liberal guy. Uh, and you have, you have, it takes all sorts. You know, I think gotcha. we mentioned before, we have 1.4 billion Catholics. So you get a mix of everything, different cultures, different ways of seeing things. And then sometimes priests take it upon themselves to be community activists, you know, and to be community organizers, with you, leveraging the Catholic Church. And sometimes they're reprimanded, sometimes they're not, depending on the leadership within that diocese and within the, uh, the overall Catholic Church as a whole. What did you just, uh, as the white guy in the room, what did you think? Of <laughs> I, I like both takes, both Anthony and Virgil. And, you know, th th I think the challenge here and what I like what Anthony just said was, the purpose of Christ is to free us from our sin life. You know, so to lure people back into some kind of slavery, whether that's slavery to color, slavery to gender, slavery to sexuality, I think it's leading in the wrong direction. So uh, what Anthony said, I think nails it, where it's, does it lead us back to Christ Jesus? That's our purpose as Christians. We want to become more like Christ. And does it free us from the sin life that we're entrapped in? His argument, Virgil, eventually turned into Jesus was a political prisoner and Jesus was a political activist. And so what we're doing is we are emulating uh, Jesus. That was his argument, Virgil, your response. Right. 
Right, right. I mean, what you see often with those who advocate social justice uh, is, a, is a minimization of who Christ is and an elevation of who we are and our role uh, to, to act as our own savior. Uh, and so that's kind of what you hear him him say when you when you go back to um, you know James Cone, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and the theology of James Cone. James Cone is the father of Black liberation theology. Our churches, particularly Black churches, and and it, this congregation serves in a sense in that like predominantly Black uh, 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 space or place where where folks are gathering. What you begin to find is we it, our churches are permeated with this, with James Coney and liberation theology, and we don't even recognize it. Many of them, it's the very air that they breathe. And so when they hear it, they it, it's, it, there's a Pavlovian response, which is what you saw uh, happening with, uh, with, with the group uh, that listened to uh, Mark Lamont Hill. I mean, he, he just would say things in a certain way, and, and there was this Pavlovian response. No one really connecting the dots as to, is this guy speaking about the scriptures rightly? Is he rightly dividing the word? Uh, is what we're reading, is it descriptive of what happened during a certain time in Israel's history to bring about the Messiah? Or is this a prescription of something that we now have to take on? So we have to become like Esther. We have to become, no one's asking those questions because they're, they're, they're just automated in their response to what he's saying. And even the the homiletic, the way in which he's saying it, the way in which he's delivering the message, all of it's problematic. Yeah, I, I thought, I mean, of many numbers of problems, but, but basically when he circled it around to that, you know, she was a Jewish woman that had to hide her identity, right. just like you have to hide the fact that maybe you're a gang member, maybe you're mm. a homeboy from around the way, maybe you're right. an ex-con and all that, you have to hide that because the kingdom doesn't recognize the value of that, but, but you do. And, and so I, I just, there was a, the kingdom that he was talking about was very worldly mm -hmm. and yes. not the kingdom that I think we're trying to create a little bubble, I guess, for a small remnant to, mm -hmm. while we wait for Jesus to return. Mm -hmm. and, and my, I, I just thought he misapplied kingdom as well. You know, when, he used, when he used the term identity and when he described it in that way, um, I just look back to you know what what I wrote about uh, earlier this year. If our identity is in anything other than Christ, then we are subject to that narrative. I have to follow through with it. So what he was saying was, if you're a black person, regardless of of your character, regardless of what you your aspirations, what your struggles, you have to assume the identity that it's such a subjective identity. You gotta follow that. And, and if you put your identity in Christ, that I am to be conformed to the likeness of God's dear son, Jesus Christ, if that's my identity, then now I'm not worried about any other ism, any other you know, demographic. I'm trying to be like Christ. And the problem with this is you miss the bigger play that the yeah. enemy is running on you. See, the bigger play that he's running on you is that he wants you to get caught up in all this other stuff. He wants you to get caught up in that so that you're not making disciples of Christ. You're not right. teaching others that, hey, your real problem was not that you were enslaved because of your skin color. Your real problem is that you were enslaved because of sin. Mm -hmm. And unless we get that piece taken care of, he'll have any other thing that will get you. And so that's why I'm pushing to Let's look at our sin problem. If we if we recognize that I am a wretched man, I am a sinner that needs Christ as my savior and my deliverer. When I come to that, then I don't get caught up in the rest of these things that can lead me further away from Christ. I'll say this quickly. There's a question that all of us deal with. We deal with several of them. Why am I here? Uh, what is my purpose? But one of the questions that we all struggle with is what do I do with my grief? Everybody who is a red blooded, air breathing human has some kind of grief, angst. What do I do with that? And unless you take it to Jesus, 
Mm. Satan has a whole lineup for you. You're angry that your father wasn't there. Here's a gang for you. You're struggling with making it in poverty. Here's drugs that you can sell. You're struggling with your identity and relationship with who you are. Hey, we got the streets ready for you. So if, if you lead into that, you'll go further into the enemy's camp. But if you come to Christ, Man, he will heal you from within. He will heal. He will help to restore you. He will leave you in a right and better place. Yeah, I, I hear all that and think of just like, you know, issues that I have. You know, whatever you get grief, you get sad about something. Next thing you know, you're eating comfort foods mm -hmm. rather than dropping to your knees in prayer and hopping on a treadmill or whatever. Yeah. You turn to comfort food. It, it can be anything. Uh, guys, I want to transition here and talk about some more uh, sad news that I think connects to sad news we were dealing with just last week. Robert Morris, uh, leader of a uh, very, very uh, powerful, large church in the Dallas area, I believe it's Gateway, uh, you know, maybe it's 10, 15, 20,000 member. They boast 100,000, but yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm sorry. Church. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, their minister has now stepped down, Robert Morris, uh, over a scandal that happened in the early 1980s. Uh, he's in his early 20s. He's married. He's a young minister. And he involves himself in some sexual way with a 12 year old. And for the next four and a half years, he's having some sort of physical contact uh, with a 12-year-old girl. Uh, this all gets settled, I believe, in 1989 or so, behind the scenes. Uh, it gets settled, and he, he goes through a restoration process of two years and now builds one of the biggest churches, certainly in Texas and certainly one of the biggest churches in America. <clears throat> uh, and now this comes out, and he has to step down. I think it had been passed off previously that he was, he stepped out on his wife with another woman, I think was the inference. I, I, it connects to Tony Evans stepping down because one, Tony Evans, as we talked about last week, uh, the leader of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, another huge church in the Dallas area. Uh, Dr. Evans has been on, I think Dr. Evans has been on this show. We, I've certainly gone down and visited with him. My memory's a little faulty. Obviously I'm a huge, uh, supporter of, of Dr. Evans. Well, he steps down because of sin, but doesn't provide the details. And that's where I think these two things connect. Robert Morris, what just, what's just come out about him and all this, makes it impossible, in my view, for Tony to come back without giving full details on what the sin was. Because... We, we're watching a big mega church that covered up pedophilia. Mm -hmm. Tony's, it feels to me like Tony has to come clean here. Anthony, uh, your thoughts. Again, it, it's, it's sad. Um, you know, you, you see it as putting pressure on, on Evans. I think in some ways it puts ministry in general under scrutiny, further scrutiny, because there's already in our culture, a slight distrust towards ministry and ministers. They think they're taking the money or messing with the women or whatever the case may be. This feeds into that, but it also feeds into some distrust of church leadership because yes. this that happened with Morris, you know, this was covered. There's, you know, now you've got tens of thousands of people. They've only known this side. They were not privy to that side and didn't have the opportunity to say, man, I probably would have left had I known this, or maybe I would have stayed, or why didn't the leadership better inform us about what's going on? So it puts, puts a light there. Um, I, I do, I can, I can agree with you. I do think this puts pressure on Evans. I'll just say back to my point though, you know, last week about Evans, I'm not sure, you know, it'll, it'll probably do some healing for some people, uh, but even after divulging it, there's still going to be some, well, I think it should have happened then, or I don't know if it'll really resolve it, but it will bring us a little bit closer to resolution. Yeah. Virgil, go ahead. 
Yeah, I, I, th this is grievous to me. Anytime we hear uh, about this and it becomes public fodder, it, it's it's heart wrenching, heartbreaking. You know, you, you know, everybody who who even watches know I'm 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 always critical about doctrine, and so I'll I'll drive home uh, the issues where where doctrine is you know divide or where 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 there's disagreement about issues of doctrine. I think that's fair game. What I don't spend a lot of time in, investing in. Is, is, is trying to find issues like this because at any point when this comes out, I think to, to the point Anthony made, it is heart-wrenching, not just for the individuals involved, but for the, for the church that's their local and for the church you know, uh, worldwide. Uh, people begin to look with a with a you know with a side eye toward what's going on uh, in churches all around. And what we've got to keep keep in mind is that while the sin that that those men are entangled in, and specifically the ones that we the issue that we know about with Robert Morris, is incredibly uh, egregious. It is it is it is unbelievable to to think about that that was covered up for that lengthy period of time. At the same time, I'm always reminded. Uh, that that when we see issues like this, uh, the, the word of God is both a mirror and a window. We need to examine our own lives, our own hearts mm -hmm. to see where we're falling short of God's glory and immediately repent of that and, and, and turn to make it right. I think that's and that's incredibly important. I think it's easy for us to look through to look through the window and say, hey, that pastor over there shouldn't be doing this and that should and that and that's correct and right. But but I, when I hear about this, it causes me quickly to examine my own heart, my own areas of shortcoming uh, and to ensure that, that I'm doing things rightly. I'm hoping that as we witness this and it, as gut wrenching as it is, uh, it causes us all to do, do some do some own per, our own personal uh, self-reflection about the matter. But it, it, it's heart wrenching. It absolutely is heartbreaking. Amen. Yeah. And I think it, the, the fact that it involved a child makes it very, very difficult. It's not a sexual sin where we're all tempted, but a child, I just don't understand it. You know, mm -hmm. I studied criminal justice in college, studied sex offenders and understand the mentality and the grooming that goes along with it. I mean, there's a whole process. But I also think this brings up uh, something important because we have two famous pastors here, right? And now we're talking about the cult of personality versus Christ Jesus. Right. Mm. So these guys became famous. They're basically celebrities, which uh, then what happens is people no longer go to the church because that celebrity has fallen. Well, we're all fallen. Right. So uh, the cult of personality I see is the, one of the most dangerous things in any church. Mm -hmm. uh, when I go uh, to a church, no matter which church it is, I listen to the sermons and I listen to the pastor. How many times they say I or me? Mm -hmm. Right. When I hear that too many times, I'm like, oh, boy, this guy wants to be a celebrity. He wants to be famous. Right. Um, so I think that's the important part, too, here is like, OK, we have to turn back to Christ Jesus. That's the point of the church. That's the point of, of our fellowship is to gather to praise Jesus. It's important to have a solid leader, someone who can lead us. Uh, and sometimes celebrity comes along with that. Sometimes significance comes along with that. But we're seeing right now the dangers of that and what are, what's the future of these churches because now the celebrity is no longer there. Will they grow? Hopefully they do. Uh, will the pastor return? Who knows? That's not important. The church needs to come back together and focus on Christ Jesus. I, I want I'm going to circle back to something you said, but I want to jump off another point you made in terms of and start with you, Anthony, and, and then Virgil, you chime in. Uh, how inappropriately did the church leaders handle this? in the 1980s, a pedophile was allowed to return to ministry after two years. How is that, I'm, I'm, we, this morning we talked about uh, 1 Timothy chapter three. I, I look for myself later, uh, but, but should, that, should that be a disqualifier or can you be redeemed from that and still be a church leader, a church elder, a, minute, a leader? You know, at that point, uh, you, you're asking, why didn't they respond this way? There was a situation in Corinth uh, in Scripture where uh, there was a heinous relationship, illicit relationship there, a man with his stepmom, and, and, and Paul rebukes them, uh, rebukes the church at Corinth, and he says, the, the real issue here is that you all were proud of this guy like you celebrated them versus calling it out. And so in this scenario, I don't know uh, Morris's 
influence with that church? Because from what I understand, there were two different churches. He stepped away from one and went to another. Yeah. The, the relationship at that church, the influence that he had, sometimes uh, people respond to that. So they will, we wouldn't want to damage that because of what it could mean to our community, what it could mean to our church. And, and, and I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that's why that could have happened. Right. Rather than looking in, here, here's a young lady whose life is going to be forever altered, forever changed because of the abuse that's happened to her. Mm -hmm. And then the next church that receives him, if they are not vetting him well, if they are not very serious about what that decision is going to make, because this decision, even though we're now 40 years removed from it, it goes back to what were y'all thinking then? That's the very question you're asking now. Like, what, what were you guys thinking then? Right. And, and I'll, I'll say this and pass it to Virgil. One thing we have to look at with ministers, and, and I'm in the same boat with this, so I'm not giving anything I wouldn't charge with myself. You don't have to preach the gospel. Like, it's not a mandate that you have to be in ministry. If you fall, if, if your influence has been damaged, if the ministry has been damaged, mm -hmm. you can be restored back to the body, but you don't necessarily have to be restored back to the pulpit. So right. while, you know, you, you, you do want men to get better and you want the church to grow, et cetera, the real seed of this is as we look at souls, as we look at uh, lifting the name of Christ, it may be an opportunity to say to this man, hey, this may not be the work that you need to work in front center stage. It's not to say that you can't be a member of the body of Christ. You can't serve. You can't work. But that now, again, that's why I was saying earlier, it brings all churches and leaderships. You know, now they're going to be looking at what else? What are you all hiding about? You know, pastor such and such a brother such and such. We didn't know. Um, so, yeah, I, I go back to. The only thing I can surmise is what they thought at the time. You know, did they not really take this into account that, wait, this was a lot more serious than the sanitized, inappropriate, you know, relationship? No, this was much more serious than that. Virgil. Yeah, I, I, I go back to what was what was said earlier about uh, this is a child. Uh, it, it's one yeah. thing. And, and again, I, I, I don't want to diminish uh, a man who is a pastor engaging in an, in an illicit affair. I don't want to minimize that. But but I do want to say there is something different about the attraction to a child. There's something just just messed up about being attracted to a child. And the fact that this went on for four years, there were at that point legal instruments that should have been uh, addressed uh, someone should have picked up the phone and called, you know, a, 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 a police officer, law enforcement. Someone should have been involved with something at that at that age at, at that age group. And and as a pastor who who uh, committed that sin, it's a wrap. It's over. You, you're you're no longer. I don't care what what the next place is you go to, or it, you you can go and be a member of the church. But to be an, a pastor after that point. Uh, it, 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 that's, that's over with. And so that's, that should have never taken place. And it, and, and someone knowing about it shouldn't have hidden it for that many, many years. And again, I don't say this as one who, who who's never sinned. I've definitely never committed those, those kinds of sins. Uh, but, but I'm, but I'm always mindful again, to look at my own life and make sure that it's, it's in line before I make judgments about anyone else. But, but needless to say, anyone in that involved in that act as a pastor should never grace a pulpit Again, they could they could preach the word to their family. They yes, could sir. shepherd their shepherd the, the the folks that are a part of their family, be involved in church at a local level, but they should not be in a pulpit. This ties into my final point that I wanted to piggyback off Kevin because Kevin, when you said something about hey, I sit there and count I or me mm -hmm. during a sermon, and it immediately made me think about myself as just th this position here with fearless and and the uh, tactic or strategy I've chosen that I'm going to confess all my sins and lay them out here on the table and use myself as an example of, hey, don't make these mistakes. This is why God's way is so much better. And so it makes me, I talk about myself quite a bit. 
and and because I'm about to do it again right now, and this is not in any way to pat myself on the back, but, but it, I'm trying to be an example to uh, men, men who have had some worldly success, men who, you know, 57 above my age, there has to be a level of self-awareness and humility that should overtake you. And again, this is where my criticism of Deion Sanders comes in. We're the same age. The lack of humility and self-awareness. And so <clears throat> for me, people have people that really care about this. Oh, Whitlock, it, it's, it's not too late for you to have kids. And, and I sit there and go, ah, as much as I would want that for myself, but is it really fair? Is it really fair? You, you're not going to be likely to be there to walk your daughter down the aisle. Is that fair to her? And so maybe things that I want, I have to say, I messed that up. And I got to deal with that and accept that. Mm. There, and so I, I could walk you through several other things, like in terms of <clears throat> there are people very close to me. Jason, you're meant to be a minister. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I messed that up. Maybe I was, but I messed it up so bad. I was so out in the world. Again, I haven't broken any laws. I haven't done what, what this guy's done. But trust me, I know me well enough to know like, oh boy, yeah. some of this stuff that I've done, if it wants to creep up and cause me pro, I'm not meant to be, I'm meant to be a follower and a supporter to ministers. That, that's, again, I love Barnabas. That's where I've taken my identity. I want someone to say, man, you really helped some ministers. Mm -hmm. Great job. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm meant to do. I'm not, and so there are things that, not, I say it all the time, not everything is for everybody. And sometimes we take options off the tables with our own behavior. Right. We have to accept that. And that's what, I know this guy was young, but there should have been some Body in his life, some of the new that should have counseled him like, hey, bro, this ain't even on the table for you. Right. You've molested a child. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing I would say about the fatherhood and things like that, yes, and I also say his will, not mine, right? Because then God uses us for his own miracles, right? And for his own purposes. And, and becoming a pastor, that's a profession, like a true profession. We profess our life to this thing. That's why it's a huge calling. And if you have that calling, you pursue it no matter what your past is, no matter what's happened. And so I think that's what we have to do. We have to disappear to our ego and ourselves at some point and listen to, God, to God's ultimate call. Yeah. So it's, that sounds like you sort of disagree with me. Uh, I, and I'm perfectly fine with what that. What I'm saying is I don't know, mm. right? Like it's God's will. Like I'm 50, I have a baby, 17 month old baby. I thought that was off the cards for me. But God bless me with this beautiful baby named Vincent and I'm so ecstatic. And it's truly a blessing. So I surrender to God's will. I, and I say that, I'll write out my plans, I'll write out my goals. And I'm like, your will, not mine. This or something better. We'll see what God has in store. Like when we plant a seed in the garden, you know, we're expecting the fruit of the seed, but we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like or how abundant it's gonna be or how sweet that fruit's gonna be. That's God's will. But we have to plant the seed in the garden to begin with. A friend of mine, uh, his, uh, he's got a brother that had a, had a ministry, had a church, um, and, and he messed it up. He had an affair. He messed it up. And he went through a period of restoration, but also in that period of restoration, he was depressed because he lost this budding ministry that he had and, and came to realize, like, man, I, I messed this up. Uh, but now what he does is he's not a minister of a church, but he spends his time in serving the church by speaking to young men. So he gets, you know, young men, he tells them, hey, this is what I had. This is how I messed it up. And this is what God has, has allowed to happen in my life. I've lost my wife, lost relationship with my kids, lost the ministry. Don't follow me is basically what this is now. So again, that's why I say for someone like Morris, back then, you know, as Virgil's talking about, had some legal procedures had taken place. That's not to say that uh, her father, because I think the report talks about her father forgive. He still can forgive. Uh, she can still forgive. The church can still pray for restoration. All that can take place. He may have been locked up for a period of time. 
may have to register. The legal procedure goes through, but that doesn't prevent him from now being able to say to, to even serve in the kingdom to say, hey, guys, th- I messed that that part up and here's how I did it. Please don't do this. You know, and, and that's that's a way, again, you know, when Virgil and I speak about this, you know, reflectiveness and the grace that we have, all of us have sinned. All of us have. And, and, and as you just pointed out, man, if everybody knew the skeletons we have in our closets, the bodies we have in our closets, all of that, man, they would look at us different. So I thank God for grace. And so when we look at others, it's not that we, man, that guy should be put under the jail. That guy right. should be. No, it's not that. But it is saying, man, because I understand how God has given me grace with grace. I'm saying to you, Morris, man. This calling is so high. Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, I'm begging that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you have been called. Mm -hmm. This calling is so high and so holy. Someone does need to say with a heart of grace. Hey, man, I think and I think that's why he's stepping down now, because from what I've, I've read, this revelation was coming out as a part of, hey, yeah, I did something back in the day this time, and I don't even know if he realized, wait, that was very, very wrong. Like, do you not understand? And now we're at the point of, you know what, I'm just gonna step down, and and that's what's taking place. So, yeah, some grace needs to be shared, but some admonition as well. Uh, Cue up harmony, Uh, I've gone a little bit long here. Uh, Cue up Harmony. Thank you, guys. Uh, Great job, as always, everybody. But Virgil, uh, we'll see you next time. How did we end up so divided? Stop fighting and to be a nation, one united, now we're headed for a downfall, God let your light shine down, what we need more than anything now, harmony, let's make a simple vow, let's come together now, harmony, put all your weapons down, love one another now, harmony, time for us to wait. Tell